Manani Pudni. That's Ghana for welcome everyone. Literally translated, it says, good you all come. Good morning. We had a summer retreat yesterday, led by uh, John and Kathy. I was thinking that maybe Kathy was here, but uh, maybe not today. Anyway, it was uh, it was a great time. The, the theme was finding God in the ordinary, and where we shared some of our stories of coming close to the Creator God. And. Um, At the beginning and at the end, we sang a new song that Kathy had written and she taught us to sing. It was called, Where is God to be Found? And she actually wrote it. Not for us, it was written back in 2010, but uh, so it wasn't new for her, but it was certainly new for us and it was a great song. And I'd like to share some of the words. God is in me and God is in you. And God is between us in all that we do. So if you're still wondering where God can be found, just open your eyes, open your eyes, just open your eyes, look around. So welcome to Pilgrim on this rather warm day. Today we've started to stream our 9.30 services for 2024, so we welcome all those online. And we pray that this time we share together will be a blessing for you. Now let us join together in our acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge that we are on the land of the Ghana people. We pay respects to their elders, honour their continuing culture, and pray that we might all work together for reconciliation and justice in this nation. Our call to worship 
is based on the Isaiah reading. And it asks some questions. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Our God is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. God never grows faint or weary with wisdom that is unsearchable. Those who rest in God shall renew their strength. They shall soar up with wings like eagles that shall run and not become weary. They shall network and never faint. We are called to celebrate the good news. In its joy we gather that we may share its blessings. May we be open to this light and to the rich possibilities that it brings us. And our prayers of who we are. Called to be of one mind, we have a wide array of ideas. Called to be united, we are more comfortable with our own kind. Called to be in agreement, still we cherish our right to dissent. Creating God, remind us again that our diversity of body, mind and spirit is a pale reflection of your expansive spirit. Enable us to embrace our diversity, not to divide, but rather to draw us closer to you and to one another. And some words from Lunig. God help us to find our true selves, the truth within us, which is hidden from our mind, the beauty or the ugliness we see elsewhere, but never in ourselves, the stowaway which has been smuggled into the dark side of the heart, which puts the heart off balance and causes it pain, which wearies and confuses us, which tips us in false directions and inclines us to destruction. The load which is not carried squarely because it is carried in ignorance. God help us to find our true selves. Help us across the boundary of our understanding. Lead us into the darkness that we may find what lies concealed that we may confess it towards the light, that we may carry our truth in the centre of our heart and bring harmony into our life and our world. And our words of assurance. Celebrate God's grace. How comforting it is to know God always accompanies us. Approach in awe. How amazing it is to consider that God has created each of us and each star in the heavens. Praise the living God. How good it is to sing praises together. So we'll sing the song, Dreams and Visions.
This morning's first scripture reading comes from the first chapter of Mark, reading verses 29 to 39. And we're using the contemporary wording of Nathan Nettleton and Bruce Pruer. Jesus finished teaching in the Capernaum synagogue and left with his followers. Taking James and John with him, he went to the family home of Simon and Andrew. On arrival, he was told that Simon's mother-in-law was crook in bed, burning up with fever. He went to her bedside, took her by the hand and lifted her to her feet. The fever cleared then and there and she set about making them welcome in her home. Uh, let's hear the story then from her perspective. Sorry. I had been disappointed. Simon had spoken so well of him and I wanted to see what made my son-in-law seem so carefree. The fever seized me that day when he came to town. So I tossed on my bed with bewildering dreams filling my head. On Sabbath morning, the others went to the synagogue while Judith stayed in place, making me sip some wine and bathed my face. They came back home, bringing this new smiling prophet, although I couldn't care less about it at that moment in my distress. They say he came and knelt, then took my hands and raised up my feverish frame and all the fever fled as he spoke my name. I found myself looking up and immediately recognised the light in his dark eyes. I rose and set the table to their surprise. Never had I felt so at home in my own house as in that healing hour when he came to my place with humble power. By sunset that day, the word was out and a crowd was gathering at the door. It seemed that the whole city was there, bringing everyone who was sick or tormented by demons. Jesus cured many people from various kinds of disease and freed many from the grip of demons. He would not allow the demons to say a word because they had him figured out. Before sunrise the next morning, Jesus got up and left the house on the quiet. He went bush in a remote area and spent the time alone in prayer. When he was missed, Simon and his mates began the search. They tracked him down and said to him, come on, you've got everyone looking for you. Jesus answered, let's hit the road so that I can broadcast the message in the other towns in this neck of the woods. That's what I came to do. And so he hiked the length and breadth of Galilee in every town he preached the message in the places where the people gathered and drove out the demonic powers. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God between us, for the word of God within us, thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. Our second scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 to 23. I don't have any reason to brag about preaching the good news. Preaching is something God told me to do, and if I don't do it, I am doomed. If I preach because I want to, I will be paid. But even if I don't want to, it is still something God has sent me to do. What pay am I given? It is the chance to preach the good news free of charge and not to use the privileges that are mine because I am a preacher. I am not anyone's slave, but I have become a slave to everyone so that I can win as many people as possible. When I am with the Jews, I live like a Jew to win Jews. They are ruled by the law of Moses 
and I am not, but I live the law to win them. And when I am with people who are not ruled by the law, I forget about the law to win them. Of course, I nearly, never really forget about the law of God. In fact, I am ruled by the law of Christ. When I am with people whose faith is weak, I live as they do to win them. I do everything I can to win everyone I possibly can. I do this for the good news because I want to share in its blessings. Let us pray. Loving God, may the words said today and the thoughts in our hearts bring us closer to you. We pray in the name of Jesus, our teacher and our liberator and our friend. Amen. In our readings from Mark in the last couple of weeks, we heard about Jesus beginning his ministry in Galilee. His message was simple. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He taught in the synagogues in a way that was different from what people were used to hearing. Mark says he taught as one having authority. What was it about Jesus that gave people this impression? He was not in a position of real authority, but he understood clearly who he was and what he was about. His words were balanced by his actions seen in his love and compassion for the sick and the suffering. And in today's reading from Mark, Jesus, after leaving the synagogue, comes to Simon and Andrew's house. He was told at once that Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. Mark says he took her by the hand and lifted her up. No magic words, no faith healers mumbo jumbo, just his presence. The fever was gone and she immediately recommenced her household duties. Anyway, the word had spread. Here was a healer who produced results. The people in the synagogue would have gone home and started to tell others what they'd heard and seen. Just imagine if they'd had Twitter and Facebook. Now, with the mother-in-law, I imagine that the women's grapevine would also have been working overtime. So that by evening, after sunset, when it was no longer the Sabbath, Mark says the whole city had gathered outside the house and Jesus went out and cured many who were sick and cast out many demons. Those of us who've been to church most of our lives are probably inured or desensitised to these stories of Jesus doing medicine without a licence and casting out demons. This is like magic stuff. Not real, maybe symbolic. And although we are now discovering that the medical knowledge in times past was far more advanced than previously supposed, we ascribe this sort of healing by Jesus as miraculous in a way that our modern miracles of medicine are not. He was not a trained physician. And then there is the demon possession. Now what was going on? This doesn't seem to mesh with our scientific understanding of life as we know it today. I might suggest that these incidents of healing and casting out demons happen too often in the gospel narratives not to have some basis in reality. I don't think we can say they are only symbolic. And secondly, I would like to suggest that there are some parallels in our postmodern world. It is now well understood by current medical practice that disease can often have a component other than the physical. People can be physically ill because they are unwell mentally or spiritually. If a deep-seated problem of the mind or spirit can be solved, the person's physical symptoms may disappear altogether, even without physical medication. We also have cases, particularly of cancer, where people go into remission without any logical explanation. 
It is accepted that there is a capacity of the mind to heal or assist in healing the body. This partly helps us explain what Jesus was doing, but it does not get us all the way, except to say that Jesus was special and something else was happening that we don't and maybe never will understand. Nor does it say in scripture that Jesus healed everybody who came. I don't think we're seeing any suspension of the physical laws of the universe here. Well, what about demons? We don't have any demons today, do we? Well, in a way we do, but not in a way that would excite vampire fans. We find this aspect hard to come to terms with because most of us have only experienced the scientific rationalist society of which we are part. The more educated we are, the more we are sceptical of anything that does not fit a scientific framework. The other stuff can be dismissed as superstition and nonsense. However, in the world of Jesus' time and in many indigenous societies today, the world of spirits is real. Di and I spent two years as lecturers at Gowlam Teachers College on the island of New Britain in 1970 and 71 when we worked for the United Church of Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. Gowlam was a training college for primary school teachers. Young people having graduated from high school at age 16, fully adults in their world, not teenagers, were sent by their villagers to train to be teachers so they could return to teach at their local village school. Many of these students would never before have left their valley or ventured far beyond it without being in fear of attack by unfriendly spirits. That they came at all we, because it was the Christian God that had the power to protect them from the evil and malignant spirits that were everywhere. Gowlam was a Christian college, a Christian place, and the local village was also Christian. So they were safe. There's no point in trying to argue that the spirit stuff is all nonsense to people who have those notions embedded in their culture and their upbringing. And then there was some spooky stuff that we can't explain. Given that background, my Christian journey has seen me taking an active role in two exorcisms conducted by ministers and also as an assistant to a Maori minister to cleanse part of the Port Augusta Hospital of an evil spirit so that Aboriginal people could safely come back and be treated with Western medicine. And then there was a smoking ceremony where I was asked by the local elders in Pipilajara, where I was the school principal, to assist in cleansing a house of evil spirits by reciting psalms and praying as each room of the house was smoked after it had been meticulously scrubbed clean, floors, walls and ceilings. When a person dies uh, in the APY lands in a village, in a house. That particular house is vacated by everyone and it remains empty. And before other people can move in, it must be cleansed of anything evil that had been hanging around. So finally we blessed the house from the outside and we prayed for the family that was to move in. And then the house was ready. Paul says in the epistle set for today, I have become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. When we move in circles that have a different world view, we need to enter into that world view if we are to be of service to those who live in them. Their world is real, even though our perspective may be from another place. Our ancient ancestors in the faith had insight into the nature of things that we are only now cultivating through science and wrapping our philosophical heads around, said one of our recent ministers. The Enlightenment gave us knowledge, but not necessarily wisdom. 
So much for evil spirits of the old kind. Perhaps we have new, more malevolent and subversive spirits abroad in our postmodern world. And we as Christians need to take them seriously. People can be possessed personally by demons. Addiction to drugs, gambling, sex, food and so on. There's also institutional evil, modern slavery, racism and war, and wherever people are used and abused, whether by governments, the church or business. So, when corporate leaders take even more money as bonuses and at the same time as shedding jobs and put people on the scrap heap, even as the company is making a loss, are there demons there? When mining companies making squillions howl down a government attempting to protect Aboriginal sacred sites or endangered species, are there demons there? When the poor become poorer and the rich get tax breaks, are there demons there? Where refugees are treated as criminals, are there demons there? Where governments imprison young children, where the major causal factors are poverty and inequality, are there demons there? I'm sure you can conjure up many, many more examples. We know these demons exist because if they think they're going to be cast out, they scream and yell and run media campaigns on the TV. Some here in this congregation are engaged in the business of casting out some of these demons. Addressing any of these social issues is a daunting task and we are called by God to do justice and bring about liberation and healing. We also have our own personal demons and we are all to some extent possessed by them. Our personal demons will kick up a fuss if and when we come to challenge them. It can be easier to leave them be. We have many rooms in our personal lives and perhaps we need a smoking ceremony from time to time to clean them out. The trouble is, even while we clean our house regularly, some of the rooms may remain locked. So that is why the kingdom is good news. People are healed and set free and demons are cast out. I can't finish without mentioning the part where Jesus disappears the next morning to a secluded spot to pray. The disciples seek him out because people are looking for him to continue the good stuff, like he's on a roll. But Jesus surprises them by announcing their departure to go to other towns to proclaim the good news. It seems obvious that the business of healing, casting out demons and expounding the message was a tiring one and the danger was it would never stop and they would never leave. Jesus needed to do two things, recharge his batteries and focus on the mission, the core business. Looking at the numbers of people needing medical attention must have been daunting and a task that would have overwhelmed Jesus and the disciples if he had let it. According to Bill Loder, crowds can dictate agendas and success can spawn its own rules. There is never enough to meet all needs. Failure to acknowledge our limitations often leads to denial of the immensity of human need because we are afraid of not being in control. We need to let go. We could despair when we remember all the injustices in our world. But if we reflect on the Isaiah reading set for today, used as our call to worship, waiting on the Lord is not sitting twiddling our thumbs, but rather doing what Jesus did when he went away to a quiet place. It is pausing to gather our wits, listening to the voice of God in scripture, amassing our resources or meditating so that our strength is renewed our wounds can heal and our next objective might be made clearer. So we need to stop, to rest with God, to know that it is not about us, our hurts, our feelings, our view of what needs to be done,
but to be about God's business, to seek it out, to know that we will never understand the fullness of it, to believe that we might be able to achieve just a little, to model as we can, change from our old ways and selfish attitudes, to love and to do what we can as best we can and to know that a new world is near. May it be so. Let us now sing. In healing Jesus did embrace, in energy we cannot trace, his love revealed in every place the mystery of amazing grace. Let us together affirm our faith with the Abba prayer. God, lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you, to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs. Forgive our weak and deliberate offences just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole. Amen. And one of the ways in which we can do this is we give our time, our energy, to work with people um, who do not have as much as we have. Over the last few weeks, you have received or been given or picked up a day of mourning um, special offering. If you didn't get one of these, then there, there are plenty in the East Porch because that is an extra way that we can give to the Uniting Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress. It says youth ministry, but in actual fact, that is their general account. So it will help them do things for the people that they are working with. And there's information there for 
how we can give to support the work of the church. So, inspired by stories of a compassionate God, may we find a good feeling in our hearts. So through these gifts, we can help free some people from hunger, lift some people from their distress, and encourage some people to be part of a better world. Amen. And our prayers of the people. There will be times of silence and inter intermediate responses. Most holy friend, you have sent us Jesus to mend that which is broken, to bridge that which is alienated, and to heal that which is diseased. In his name, our troubled hearts speak to you, God, of those many people whose needs are great and whose comforts are few. We speak to you of our concern for places where there is conflict, violence and misery, war-ravaged countries, domestic cruelty, bullying in school grounds, workplace intimidation, gang warfare on streets or terrorist attacks. Loving God, hear our prayers. Holy friend, save your people. We speak to you of our concern for all displaced people in refugee camps, fugitives from oppression, those crowded on unseaworthy boats, those in refugee and detention centres, and for all separated families and traumatised children. Loving God, hear our prayers. Holy friend, save your people. We speak to you of our concern for neighbours, workmates, or members of our own families who are doing it tough. The unemployed, the disabled, some fighting terminal illness, others in despair from broken relationships, some grieving a death, many caught up in predicaments for which there seems no obvious answer. Loving God, hear our prayers. Holy friend, save your people. We speak to you of our concern for the church, with its flourishing or weak congregations, some living in comfort and others surviving under persecution, some filled with self-doubts and some with over-self-confidence, churches without ministers, or those where, sadly, there is conflict between ministers and laity. Loving God, hear our prayers. Holy friend, save your people. We speak to you now, loving God, of ourselves. Help us, in our own small way, to be more like your compassionate Christ. Shape our thoughts, sift our feelings, supervise our efforts, bless our abilities, that we may get the best out of each day and give the best to those around us. 
who through the grace of Christ Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. And we sing acknowledging some of our brokenness. We sing beauty for brokenness.
please be seated. Thank you. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view. The kingdom is not beyond our efforts, it is beyond our vision. We accomplish in our lifetime only a tiny fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. Nothing we do is complete, which is another way of saying that the kingdom always lies beyond us. This is what we are about. We plant seeds that one day will grow. We water seeds already planted, knowing that they hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that produces effects beyond our capabilities. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realising that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for God's grace to enter and do the rest. Go now and trust in God's mercy for your strength. Proclaim the good news wherever God calls you and do not set yourselves apart from others. But be all things to all people for the sake of the gospel. And may God give you the strength and freedom of an eagle. May Christ be the bread that nourishes and renews you. And may the Holy Spirit be the rising wing, wind beneath your wings. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. Let us pass the peace to each other.